the Nature Conservancy. And our panel today, um, that was the last one was on teaching um, in the, the system. And this is more around research. And I want our panelists to introduce themselves and say what you do, just briefly. Hi, my name's Erin Bray. <laughs> So, my name is Erin Bray. I'm an assistant professor at California State University, Northridge. Um, I started a year and a half ago as part of a newly formed water science cluster initiative. Uh, we're building a water science program. It's interdisciplinary uh, across different departments at Cal State Northridge. Um, and my research is mainly in physical processes in rivers that matter for fish habitat. So, mostly hydrology, um, fluvial geomorphology, and spring temperature kind of work. Good morning, I'm Sarah Yarnell, and I'm at the Center for Watershed Sciences here at Davis. Um, I'm a professional researcher, and a lot like um, Aaron's group, we are a completely interdisciplinary group, and my background is in both hydrology, geomorphology, and river ecology, so I really, a lot of my work and research focuses on integrating those together to understand larger applied research problems. Okay, so you already heard from me, Ted Grantham, Upper Extension Specialist, and this is a professor at UC uh, Berkeley. I'm a freshwater ecologist and dabble in hydrology and geomorphology. I do a lot of work on environmental flow and science. Faith Kearns, and I feel like I'm getting back to my roots today. It's been about probably 18 years since I've been at one of these meetings. Um, and so I'm a freshwater ecologist by training, but I now work in a, the California Institute for Water Resources, which is part of UC Cooperative Extension, um, and also is a USGS-supported state water institute, um, whose goal is largely around connecting um, the higher academic or higher institutes of higher education in the state with federal agencies. As you can imagine in California, that's an incredibly complicated thing to do given how many campuses we have. And so I spend a lot of time basically writing about others, other people's research on water and trying to kind of um, broaden the set of things that we consider when we talk about water in California. Okay, great. So. Um, one thing that comes to mind, and this is my boss is really classic about this, we'll walk into a room and he'll have one word on the board that says relevance, like, are you relevant? And so I think that's um, like talking about freshwater science and how do we, we make ourselves relevant in terms of um, management of this uh, scarce and important resource in the state. And so the first question I have, and we can do the same thing we did the last time if you have um, something to say, just pass the mic along, but so what are the gaps and or limitations to conducting student-led research in these systems that is relevant to agencies for managing water in the state? Um, so within the CSU system, as Matt covered before, it's really a teaching-focused institution primarily, and I'm in kind of one of these these unique positions where we're trying to do research um, and also collaborate with stakeholders and engage with agencies um, related to broadly across river science and water science. Um, and so I think a big challenge that we've had is, um, first of all, just resources, um, access to lab space, um, access, access to funds so that we can send students to the field um, we, a lot of our field research is really centered around class schedules and student jobs that are off campus and also students who have families. Um, and so kind of a lot of us who are the, um, the teachers at these institutions, we had research training in primarily research institutions. And so kind of this lofty idea of going to the field for a month at a time and collecting bugs and water temperature sensors and things like that, it's really not practical uh, within the CSU system. Um, and another reason for that is because we primarily are doing research with master's students or upper division undergraduate students. And the turnaround time for those degrees, it tends to be fast, especially we have many transfer students. So we have only, you know, 
two years, and by the time they really get going on their project, it becomes one year. And so to create a really seamless thread of a research program within the CSU system has a lot of challenges. Um, and I'll pass this on to the others. I think one other thing that we would like to be better at is aligning student uh, success timelines with projects that are relevant to agencies also on agency timelines. And I think for, for me, I do work in river restoration, and sometimes these river restoration projects can, can take years and years and years of planning, you know, channel redesign, gravel augmentation, and as, as all of you ecologists know, then it takes also a lot of time for the biotic life to, to take hold in those systems. And so these end up being kind of eight to 10 year projects that we want to tie into. And we need to work better with agencies to understand how to really um, parse out uh, kind of engagement research activities with agencies that are meaningful both to the agencies and doable within a master's student timeline. So one comment, one of the challenges that, that I've experienced at the University of California in um, you know, doing management relevant research um, has been the difficulty in getting graduate student support through through grant programs, for example. And uh, recently, many of the state grant programs have actually prohibited the use of grant funds to go towards tuition and fees for students, um, which creates a really significant barrier, um, especially as tuition fees continue to go up at the university and have, figuring out ways to support graduate students to do the type of work that the state, um, the state demands. And so that's just one. Um, I'm not quite sure <laughs> who made that decision um, and why that decision was made, but it seems really counterintuitive when we're trying to get um, you know, both train graduate students and get them uh, get sort of academic institutions to focus on the problems that are most relevant to, to agencies. Great. Okay. Um, the next question I have for you is, um, well, since we're talking about the next 25 years, what do you see as the most important research and extension priorities for freshwater science in California moving forward? I think it's a great question. I think water itself is absolutely a great focus for so many issues that we face here in California. Um, I was noticing the list that, uh, I think it was Matt had up on the board about the stuff that's, oh no, it was you, Ted, that the stuff that's covered in the UC extensions and freshwater science is listed, but then it's things like forestry and agriculture, all of which play into water. Water plays into all of that. And so um, recognizing and understanding that water is central to so many of these aspects, I think is key. And then the fact that, I guess from my perspective, the fact that the climate is changing and we're seeing more, more extreme changes between you know, climate and things are not the same as they have been, you know, 50 years ago, a lot of our research tends to look back at the last 50 years to predict how to move forward, and that is simply an unknown realm that doesn't, isn't working as well as it has been. So more focus on trying to creatively and innovatively think about um, how to assess the changes that we expect and are starting to see in water, and then how does that translate to all of these areas that we work in, um, I think is a really exciting and sort of a, a upcoming need that's going to be happening for management across all of the sectors. If anybody wants to add or have a different idea. <laughs> so let's have one more. One, one, um, one comment. I mean, I think, um, and, you know, as we saw kind of this, this morning, you know, freshwater science by its nature is, is interdisciplinary, and I think we do a good job of crossing, um, you know, sort of to the physical and biological sort of science science realms, I think in the next 25 years to become sort of more more relevant and more impactful, um, more engagement with sort of the social sciences um, and addressing issues of concern to people in California, particularly around disadvantaged communities and around water security and access, I think um, is an area where we need to move. Um, how, how we do that, I think, is, is sort of an, an unknown.
I would say for me, um, working at really a statewide level and on kind of all water issues in the state, really, that a lot of the more exciting stuff to me is happening in um, where people in really different fields can really listen to each other. So there's a lot of really interesting, like it was interesting seeing your slide about who does water, because that's something I struggle with defining all the time. And you define it quite narrowly, I think. Um, but if you look at people who are working on water in the UC and CSU systems, there are sociologists, there are artists, there are, I mean, there are a ton of people working on water. It's just that we tend to define it in this really incredibly narrow way, which I think has and still will serve people well, but I think the conversation happening at the state level um, doesn't, it's not so conducive to be so narrowly defined when we're talking about water. And I will pick up on one thing Tina said, which is that these students come in kind of really loving water um, for reasons that don't have to do with like what bug is in a stream. And so how do we really capture um, that's, that sense without then um, kind of uh, uh, pushing people out because it all becomes about the science as opposed to actually loving this thing, right? And so, there, so my sense is people will say people don't care about water, and and that's not the, that to me is not the truth. Everywhere I go, I talk to people about water. People really care about water. Um, I think we just have to stop pushing on them that they don't care about it in the way that we do. So, um, yeah, just so I'll just add another little follow up because I think it's a great point in that. Um, water really does encompass a lot of different things, and maybe one thing that we could do better is really showing folks how how our science is not just a, a narrow box of science. Our science can be very applied and can be very relevant to anybody who is interested in water. We have a lot of students who come in, you know, in the very first class they take, they, they have no idea, they live in San Francisco and they have no idea that their water comes from a national park, right? And so where does your water come from? How does it get there? Oh, this is relevant to you, and the science behind it is this, and this is why it's important to you. So part of our part of our outreach and, and, and ability to do, to do better, to move forward, to ask some of these creative you know questions and come up with innovative solutions that we're going to need in the next 25 years is to expand that discussion and take our science and make it more applied and relevant to a lot of folks around. And I think that'll help instigate creative you know concepts from people who may be outside of our field, and then that will help to spur forward. I think a lot of um, sort of innovation that's going to be needed in, in the next 10 to 20 years. Uh, just one last thing to add. I also think we need to really encourage students and partnerships that are really um, kind of embracing the fact that we work in inherently dynamic systems. And so maybe the last 25 years of freshwater science, at least from a river's perspective, was um, how do we adapt to human modifications and still sustain ecosystems? And, um, and so a lot of that had to do with dams and and kind of adapting. And now we're moving into really new territory because now we're, we're studying systems where we're removing dams. And so it's almost like we're reversing our science or kind of turning it upside down and saying, okay, how are these systems now responding to a new normal? And I think that that's constantly gonna be a challenge in the next 25 years that we need to be creative in our research and also our collaborations to, um, to kind of keep pushing new science yeah, that's great. Um, so just picking up on that, um, what you all have been saying, then it, it sounds like you're really saying we should be pushing the boundaries outside of our small boxes. And so how would you, how would you see opening that up to be more diverse, more inclusive, um, more equitable, and reaching across uh, different fields um, to do that around water in California? I'm holding the microphone, apparently. So, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. And um, I really appreciated the previous panel discussion talking about students because I think my perspective, you know, I work at a university, I deal with students, and I work a lot with agency folks. And so the new young people coming in, that, that, that demographic that I see are students. And so broadening that student base and getting um, new perspectives in and, and figuring out ways to, to make what we do relevant to their interests, kind of going back to the discussion about people do care about water, students do, you know, everybody wants clean water to drink. They don't want to be worried about whether or not they have to boil water or not, right? And so these fundamental basics do start to expand into a bigger picture, and I think we can um, do a better job of helping to show our students um, 
those make those connections into like applied uh, practical um, applications. And so I, I think doing the outreach to bring in different perspectives and engaging with a, a broader community is probably the first way that I would sort of approach and, and would, would want to um, to see change and move forward. I don't know if anybody wants to add. Yeah, so one of the things I've started to get, I'm, I'm firmly mid-career at this point, and um, one of the things that I've started to see more, uh, be affected more by, and be truly concerned by, um, has not so much to do with just are we bringing diverse people into a room, but like what, what what's in the room? Um, and I think that's going to be one of the main challenges moving forward is that um, some of these spaces can be really unwelcoming and that um, the sort of career options for people are perhaps not as robust. Um, I think, you know, because part of that whole thing of it's, it's wonderful to get students trained, but then what are they, what kind of jobs are they going into? What kind of, um, you know, as, as somebody who, I, there, there are a lot of, uh, gatekeepers um, in terms of, you know, what, once you're sort of in the field, how can you actually change it? And so, um, you know, that to me is a much larger issue because it gets into kind of the very fabric of our institutions and what they can handle. But I don't think it's enough to just focus on sort of student diversity. We need to be kind of changing the whole field, um, including at meetings like this. Um, and, and in all of our professional interactions. And my sense in California is that the professional water sector has this figured out in a slightly better and different way. And I kind of wonder what we can learn from them because at least on the more sort of academic side, which I know this is a very mixed group, um, but definitely from what I see in the academic side, um, as you move up and up, um, the field tends to be more and more and more exclusive. And so those are things that are gonna need to get reconciled at some point. Faith, can you, I mean, maybe the panel, can you expand just a little bit um, on that in terms of kind of that um, that idea of the, the gatekeeper and kind of this exclusivity, this exclusiveness of, of the, um, the field? Can you just maybe just expand on that a little bit and then we'll close it up and, and um, ask the audience for questions? Um, sure. I mean, I don't, want to, I don't want to be too negative about it, um, so I'm trying to find a way to be... But, I just think that there can be a serious disconnect between the sort of sense of like, yay, it's all about getting diverse people and then everything will change, when what I've seen from the other side is that there can often be a pushback to keep things somewhat the same and you end up with a, a set of mid-career people who are um, frustrated and cynical and not able to find ways to move forward. And so, um, Again, I just think it's an issue to take really seriously. It's really easy to push it off onto student diversity um, and not think so much about the, the, the next professional stages. Anybody else want to add? Okay, um, all right, great. So questions from the audience, Terry? So I appreciate your question on relevancy, and I'm going to direct this to the panel. I mean, as someone in the twilight of my career, um, you know, don't laugh. <laughs> you know, I, uh, it's nice that there's a lot of work figuring out what bug is in what stream and how to restore this river. But the issue in California is about water and water scarcity. Water is over allocated, and water will become scarcer as climate change continues. So, the, you know, I can say climate change because I'm far away from EPA. But, so the question is, you know, how is your stuff relevant to that? You know, why as I, as a manager, care about what you're doing? How is it going to inform the question about water resources? And, and why should I give a damn when I want my lettuce? Well, I'll take this one because I work at the Center for Watershed Sciences, and one of the key um, focuses that the center in particular does is to bring together interdisciplinary researchers from a lot of different perspectives to directly address those exact questions. Um, some examples, for example, that, um, <laughs> that was a great statement, sorry. Some examples that more recently that have been occurring is there's a, a, a group that has come together of NGOs, 
uh, university folks, um, researchers, and nonprofits to specifically address environmental flow management across the state. Um, and the research that's being done is to help better come up with tools to help provide and synthesize data to inform management choices then that can be, um, that, that then become a social value decision. But in order to make, as a manager, to be able to make that social and value decision, who gets the water, when, and where, I need to have good, solid data that everybody agrees on. And that is a huge challenge, and being able to communicate that to the managers, I think, is a fundamental responsibility of us as scientists. And so, for example, I see my role as doing really good research, bringing in diverse students who have different perspectives and backgrounds than I do, right? Um, you know, I, I work, I, we very purposefully go down and work with folks at UC Merced and are really trying to bring in a lot of the Central Valley communities and families from there who have a totally different perspective than, for example, what I might have grown up with, come together, discuss those, do relevant solid science, and then be able to interpret that science and help help provide and make that science and data accessible to folks who might not have the same background as us, particularly managers, and, and come up with examples for how you might apply that. I would never say that my job is to tell somebody what they need to do with their water, but my job is to say, here's what the data is telling you and some choices that you might consider and then to work with that manager for them to help make that decision. And I think that that is a, is a great way to really connect the research and the science that we're doing, bringing students into that so they can see that perspective. They will have a different perspective and ideas on what that is, and then help put that into action and application. And I think increasing those collaborations, like I, you know, I think it was Allison mentioned earlier, being able to connect like what we do with some of the, the other communities and CSU populations, for example, would be a great connection. Having UC Extension work with and bringing those students maybe into the field, into some of their field research offices where students can actually see how science works and how that can actually make a change. And that, that will embolden them to then figure out ways and move forward to make that more relevant. So to me, I think that that's a great example of how, how this can be done and how we as a community can, can help support those, those actual applications and changes in management. I'll respond a little bit too, just to say that um, I started out as a freshwater ecologist doing bioassessment stuff, and um, over the past 20 years, my career has completely morphed into, um, because I think I work at a statewide level, and so this relevance question is sort of constant, um, but the approach I've also decided to take with it is to be slightly subversive about that, which is to um, try to actually just start teasing apart in a more fundamental way, like you know, go back to pretty fundamental questions like why in the state of California do we only think of water from a utilitarian perspective, right? And so that's where, again, collaborating, I think, with some of our humanities and um, social science colleagues, like they're already doing a lot of critiquing work that's very interesting. And it's not in this very applied way that's like, we have, you know, we know you know you need, it's, it's going back to these fundamentals of like, who's in power in California? Who gets to decide? Why do those people get to decide? Why do we only think about water and how it's used and not what its public value is? You know, and so there are lots of different entrees, I think, to that question, and I think it requires lots of different perspectives. Um, so yeah, it's it's a very important question though. Back here. Hi, um, I'm Tammy Church, I'm from the Zone 7 Water Agency, which is also Alameda County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, comma, Zone 7. And I, I have um, a proposition and maybe a plug for, for working with the local agency. So I help oversee and adopt a creek spot program, and I'm wondering if there's any way that a lot of the educators and the colleges and the universities have considered kind of an adopt a creek spot program for research. Like, have you established these connections and an understanding of like for our, for instance, Alameda County, such that when you get these students who are really interested in these watershed issues or these water utility issues, that you have these connections and you can start going to these creeks and streams, you know, time after time after time, students can collect data and start contributing to a larger data set that future students can work off of because we have a lot of the water utility data because that's what we care about, groundwater basin management, um, water supply, but as one of our directors would say, fish don't pay taxes, so we don't have a lot of the ecology science-based data. 
And I just think this would be a really great opportunity for us to have this maybe subversive ecology data in our back pocket to use when measuring against a lot of the water utility side of the information. Because we have streams that have fish and really interesting water use issues and flood control issues and flood protection and watershed. And we're trying to expand that we are a very small agency and we don't have the money and funding for a lot of these really interesting studies and we benefit from it. So come on, send your students down our way. <laughs> I'm not sure there's a quick question, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm all for it. Um, we, we'd love to get students more more involved in, in those types of um, those types of efforts, and just kind of hearing hear, hearing you talking. Um, though I just want to kind of kind of flip things a little bit too, and just um, think about how how important um, individual you know, faculty and researchers can 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 be on campus and having the sort of the capacity, uh, building the capacity of our sort of freshwater. Um, faculty to 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 get involved with all of the various issues that are that are that are relevant, and I think um, you know I'm you know been at Berkeley for a couple of years now, and, and I'm learning about the process by which um, positions are, are are created and developed, and um, it's no longer a black box, but it's still sort of a gray box, and I'm sure it's a black box to folks that are outside of the institutions, but. Um, I think, you know, kind of collectively, um, you know, our community of freshwater scientists on you know, across and all these different capacities could do more um, in, in thinking about you know, how can we can strategically build the capacity at the university to get people that are interested and have the technical skills and, 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 and talent to to work on these um, work on these issues. I would love to see both this both an extension. Um, you know, where I do most of my work and, and at the research level. And I think one example of this happening is with the, the recent hire um, at UC Davis where they developed the, the California trout, got a big donor to create um, an endowed chair for Peter Moyle's position when he retired because they recognized that he just played such an essential role and they played, they were able to create this endowed chair and uh, we can do this for, you know, it takes a lot of money. But uh, just as just an example of, of how uh, sort of outside institutions and outside entities can, can collectively really shape um, what the university looks like and the research that's that's conducted um, conducted there. It's, it's not something I think that we give a lot of thought to, but I think even just demonstrating, uh, you know, both UC and CSU, we have a, a mission and a responsibility to the people of California to address the issues that matter, right? And I think if we can create a collective voice and ideally pool some resources, um, I think the university will be very can be receptive. It still takes work to um, to 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 filling those those needs, but we have to um, express those needs in a convincing and and loud a loud way. And there's a lot of other fields and sectors that, do, that are very good at this, and I don't think we're very good at this. And that's something that we can really work on as a, as a community. Hi, I'm Kate and James. I work in the timber industry. And I guess as a member of the regulated public, I would say that there's a tremendous amount of jobs out there. And there's a lot of need for people that have these skills, but they have to be willing to work really hard. You know, one of my favorite sayings is science is not glorious. You know, you put in a lot of work. And I think that lots of times people overlook that private industry has a ton of jobs. I mean, Terry's talk yesterday was really hit me, it rang very true, because we, all of our regulations are really force us to protect the water in the state of California. And so I think a lot of times people don't understand that, you know, you can have airy-fairy discussions, but the bottom line is people have to meet those regulations, and people have to do the work on the ground. And from what I know from the industry conferences I go to, whether it's PG&E, you know, or the timber industry, there's a lack of, of people to do the work. So I would encourage students to work hard, to get a very specific degree, not an interdisciplinary degree, because often those folks don't understand the basics of science, and so they can't do a lot on a crew, but get to the field. So I wouldn't encourage just you know, classroom. You have to get to the field and you have to have field skills. 
So I think a lot of the answer is there's a tremendous amount of work in the regulated public and people have to be willing to do that because the government and academia can never bridge these gaps. There's a lot more industry and jobs outside of academia that will address these issues and most likely industry will figure out the answers, not you. And that's because we have to, because we're regulated to. So if you want a job, you know, there's a lot of jobs. You just need to be willing to not take the exact job you thought you might take. Like, I never thought I'd work for the Tim Renners. Oh my God, no. You know, but I had to work. I'm a first generation college person. First person in my family to get a master's or a PhD, even a college degree. But I took jobs because I had to. And I am totally against internships. I hate that word because you should be paid to work. As someone that had to work to feed myself, you know, this internship thing, I think if you're not being paid, you're not valued. And that's how industry looks at it. So if you promote that, I think that's a mistake. So get a job that pays, work really hard, and you will make change, but you have to just work, and you have to do the best work possible, and you just gotta do it, because there's tons of work out there. It's always shocking for me to go to these conferences and to hear that people don't think there's jobs, because there's a lot of jobs. And if you look at the employment statistics, you know, it's, we're looking for people, but those people have to wanna work more than 40 hours a week, and they got to be good in the field. And, you know, we still drug test. That's a huge thing for private employers in the state of California. You know, we have to adhere to federal law. So just, you know, if you're a student, you'll have a bright future. The jobs are out there. Anybody want to respond to her comment? I would, I would just add that I appreciate hearing that. And I think um, part of the lack of, if there's a, there's a decided lack of communication um, between those. So, so we do have students who come and say, hey, where can I get jobs? And so if um, a better collaboration between the government and the government jobs, the university jobs and positions, and the private industry jobs, I think will go a long way towards helping and in, in, um, address some of the issues that, that you just raised. And so, so, for example, if I knew that, like, hey, in addition to these government jobs that are posted out there, it, you know, here's a whole slew of private sector jobs that are available, too, I would absolutely give that information to my students. And I think a lot of internships are paid. Um, we, uh, I only ever have volunteered with students who uh, offer to volunteer. All the internships we provide are paid. So I think it's um, important to clarify um, what is available between paid internships and volunteer internships because I 100% agree people should be paid that absolutely opens the doors for more students and more people to get involved and so I would um, Support the idea of a better collaboration between private industry and those government agencies and the university and really open the channels of communication So that some of those bridges can be crossed more effectively All right, great. Well, thank you so much. Let's hear uh, give a hand to our panelists.